Fifth metatarsal fractures are very common. We all treat them all the time. And what we're going to do is look at some of the um, misconceptions around fixation methods and uh, what is the consensus out there. So this is a standard fifth metatarsal base fracture. Um, most of us will recognize it. How many are going to fix it on day one? Can I have show of hands for people who are going to fix it on day one? Come on, raise your hands. One, two, any more? And how many non-operatively? Lots. Okay, great. Okay, so non-operative again varies from what you do, whether you put them in a cast, you put them in a uh, walking boot, you put them in a, uh, a tubic grip. So the remit of this um, talk is not to talk about the non-operative uh, methods. Um, we're going to talk about the me operative methods. So if you were to fix it, how are you going to fix it? Okay, so you can look at these and there are a variety of methods uh, described to fix a fifth metatarsal base fracture. Okay, and we will try and see what the evidence says for this. So this guy obviously didn't have his treatment. This is now three months down the line. He's now having a conversation with the operative surgeon or the uh, physician he's seeing and given a choice to have an operation at this point. How many are you going to operate? How many of you are going to operate on this one? Now five, four, okay. More hands going up. Right. It's now 30 months down the line when he comes to see me. Okay, so he said, well, I'm not going to have an operation. I'm just going to live with it. But now he's struggling big time. So bear this case in mind because we will come back to it in the end. And we'll try and clarify some of the misconceptions in assessment as well as their fixation. Okay, this guy, James Calder, is well recognized in the world of foot and ankle in the UK. And he did this editorial, foot and ankle editorial bit in the um, British Journal. And he says, in view of the relatively high non-union rate, for metaphysial diaphysial fractures. And I think we need to understand this concept. Where is he talking about? Uh, which bit of the fracture? Because that gets a lot of uh, you know, misunderstanding around where this fracture is. So because of that, it, in elite athletes, you should be thinking of fixing them straight away. So where he's talking about is this. Everybody happy with that? OK. And this is the Jones fracture, which is against your fourth metatarsal base. Yeah? And that, that's where he's talking about. And true Jones fractures are not that common. What we see is the tuberosity fracture, and we see zone three fractures more commonly. We don't see it as many Jones fractures. So the problem is the blood supply. We know there is watershed. These will go on to non-union. All right? And this is not new. He's not telling us something that we didn't know. This is, you know, 80 years ago. Somebody's already told us that. So high rate of healing, so when to operate. This one is, a, I've picked it up from a paper. And they are primarily fixing these base zone one fractures. We know they heal them. Why do an unnecessary operation? Okay, that's a no-no in my books. Zone three heal up as well, but look for their hind foot wearers. And we'll come back to that in a minute. We know Jones fractures can lead to one in five non-unions, okay? So when are we going to operate on them early? Are we going to wait till they go into delayed or non-union? And in terms of your x-ray being uh, showing no healing, but patient being completely pain-free, are you still going to operate on them? And what is your preferred technique? And what does the literature say? So we know avulsion fractures, we're fine to treat them whichever way you want to treat them, really. The zone one, you put them in a plaster, you put them in anything, they're going to heal up. Okay, so that's fine. Jones fracture, yes, there is earlier return to sport uh, and healing, uh, and that's been shown in another study. Right, a type of fixation. This is a common method again. You do tension bend wire. Um, it's poorly tolerated by the patient, and your reduction, holding the reduction is much more difficult and metal work removal, one in two will come back to you. So if you're a private practitioner, you want to do two operations for one uh, problem, then yes, that's a good, good idea. Um, but yeah, generally, intramedullary screws are the standard now. Couple of things, your fifth metatarsal fracture is, fifth metatarsal is not straight. It's got a natural curve to it, and if you put a screw too long, you're gonna straighten it, and you don't want to do that. Yeah, so you want to do, uh, your fixation, but you don't want to straighten the metatarsal in, as a result. So don't put a too long a screw. 
bigger screws are better. Size does matter in most things in life. Um, but don't go mad putting a 6.5 screw in in the canal that's not going to take it. You're going to create more fractures than there was in the first place. All right. You go for a 5 millimeter, and there are custom made. Um, you know, uh, jigs and implants for these, but I use a standard 5 mil uh, if the canal can take it. If, the, if it can't, then you go for a 4 mil if you've got a really petite patient, but aim for a 5. Does it matter if you use titanium or stainless steel? It doesn't really matter. Do a good job, that's what matters, really. Um, and you do either your variable pitch ones or your partially threaded ones. As long as you can get the compression at the fracture site, again, it doesn't matter. This is a standard setup. This is your mini C arm that we have in our theater. You put the foot on the mini C arm and you can get it an X ray. Okay? The key here is not, so your incision is almost a centimeter proximal to where the base ends. And also be very careful with your soft tissue entering the uh, uh, soft tissues there. Don't go on the tip of the uh, fifth metatarsal. It's high and in. So the take home message is you've got to be high. You've got to be in to be in line with the metatarsal. Okay, what are the complications? This is, again, although not common, but you can prank a nerve entering it. Small chance of infection. Refracture, again, yes, you can, if you have a stress razor particularly, you'll have a refracture more distally. And removal of hardware screws with screws is much less than it is with your uh, tension bend wires. Okay, we come back to our case now. 30 months um, down the line, something's got to be done. He's symptomatic with it. What else would you want to know? Well, you would want to know how the hind foot is, all right? If they've got a varus in the hind foot, that's got to be looked at as the first thing. You would want to know whether their lateral ligaments are stable or not, okay? And you would also want to know what else has gone on. If we look carefully on there, the second uh, base had a fracture, which had gone into non-union. We also had some stress response around the third, so it was fracture around the third base. The bone profile, you need to know the biology of uh, the foot, okay? So that's got to be looked at, that was normal. And what to do now? So what you do is a combination of surgery. You don't just address the obvious, you've got to get the hind foot out into the neutral, you get the first ray off the ground so that your hind foot moves into, the, uh, into your normal alignment and you fix your second as well, and he's, he's very happy. So the take home is, true joints fractures are not common, but one in five may go, go on to delayed or non-union, so be, be aware of that. If you've got a professional athlete, if you're in that kind of practice, you may choose to just do that primary fixation for them. And IM screw is the, is the preferred technique, and five millimeter or larger, if you've got big canal, don't be afraid to do a big screw. Thank you very much.